Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are y'all doing this? Uh, oh, I'm sure it's uh, already into the morning. Yeah, it's already 1.30 a.m. where I'm at. So, um, how are y'all doing this uh, early Sunday morning? I hope you had a good week. Um, it's all right. There was uh, the, the, uh, the, the last couple of hours of the day kind of... Uh, thank, thank, thankfully, my uh, boss man let me go a little bit early. Um, that was cool. Um, this evening, uh, we have the Carrington event uh, by Fascinating Horror. Diablo 4 uh, gameplay um, we'll have tonight and uh, the bulk of tomorrow. Because uh, I will be uh, streaming tomorrow. Um during the afternoon, uh, once, uh, I recover some sleep, um, and then, uh, we will, uh, watch, uh, some weird history, uh, timeline, starting with 1993, uh, and possibly some other stuff, um, I may m mix, uh, Diablo 4 and, um, other content, um, uh, just because uh, I plan on trying to do a long stream tonight, um, at least until like four. So, I um, the, the way I look at it, um, sort of like uh, you you know, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit here, but like late night when you know like late night television. It's like Friday night and you're not quite old enough to go out and party like you want to and uh, like uh, but you still have some mischief that you can get into um, and you know maybe you're at home uh, like and you you're surfing late night television and um, you know this the, the kind of shit you would do on a Friday Saturday or possibly Sunday night while you're uh, uh, trying to hold back the, uh, the new week, uh, before school or the new work week. Um, and uh, that's right now, that's what my kind of my format is. Um, I bring you some stuff, uh, from around the internet and we take a look at it. Um, this is as much my entertainment as uh, I hope it is for you. Um, I, Yeah, I'm, 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 at least, I'm not, not yet, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to re reinvent any wheels here, um, the way I look at YouTube is, uh, very much like, uh, like 10 billion cable channels that you can hop into and, um, and, and check out anytime you want, and, um, it would be my pleasure to bring you some of the weirder, odder, um, or more interesting tidbits uh, from uh, those corners of the web. Um, and once again, this is Total Eclipse uh, from, uh, and um, uh, he has um, uh, music on Spotify that is free for you to use in your videos. Um, which, uh, thank you very much. Please give him a follow. Um, it is this guy, right? Yeah, this guy, right here. Yeah, good dude. Um, so, um, the very first thing we're gonna do tonight is uh, called the Carrington event, as you can see on the menu, um, by Fascinating Horror. Um, these guys are good. Um, I'm already subbed to this guy. Um, as uh, I have not seen this yet, I've been saving this for you guys. I very much uh, like uh, content that I put up on here to be fresh. It's uh, kind of a, re uh, a, a react, uh, but uh, you know, again, this is entertainment that I would have watched anyway. But I, you know, I want to watch it with you guys. That's just the way I feel, um, and uh, because I forget until I'm halfway in all the time, I'm Joshua with American Known Productions, 
Um, I hope you have uh, some snacks, something to drink, something to smoke. I have a number of things this evening. Um, uh, the green, uh, the green gods were good to me, uh, this week. I, I cannot complain. Um, so, um, let's do a dab. And we'll get into the Carrington event, because I'm very fucking curious about this. I've also been uh, uh, peeping uh, <clears throat> a number of builds um, that are uh, very interesting for the Necromancer. Um, uh, Necromancer is always the class I go for. Uh, all the way back since um, uh, Diablo 2, I think, was when the Necromancer first came out. Maybe earlier. But um, I remember... being able to have uh, an insane amount of skeletons uh, 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 or that you could have an insane amount of skeletons on screen at once uh, especially when you decided to break the game um, <laughs> um, but I've always liked uh, the aspect of summoning creatures uh, and um, having them destroy things uh, in a spectacular fashion uh, that gets you loot and gets you progression. Um, Diablo is um, the only time it ever... Well, okay. So the first time, the first Diablo was, was, was kind of breaking the wheel or uh, I should say not breaking with uh, reinventing a whole new fucking wheel. Um, Diablo 2 um, took that wheel, broke it back down to its constituent parts, rebuilt that motherfucker, added four, nor uh, four new uh, uh, nuclear reactors onto that bitch, packaged it all back up and shipped it out again, and all of a sudden things were like, ooh, boy howdy. Um, uh, Diablo 3 just kind of fucked with the shape of the wheel and then sanded off the treads a little bit and fucking added new weird ones that fucking did shit that nobody fucking asked for in the first place but you know like it, it made some some people okay and you know, like some people like that I didn't I fucking like I I lost interest in that game so hard uh my wallet felt the pre-order price so like it i didn't even like order the the, ex, uh, the the expensive one or anything um but uh yeah i dropped that game like a fucking ton of bricks i don't know where i went but i went somewhere else really fucking hard it's probably an mmo uh i was really upset with that game um diablo mortal as i've said before Despite its monetar monetization um, on 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 a on a level that I have never personally witnessed before, um, like I know there are other gotcha games that are much more uh, predatory or as predatory as Diablo Immortal, but I never expected that kind of brutality to come out of Blizzard um, uh, for such bullshit. Um, I'm not ashamed of the amount of money I spent in it. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I mean, anything that looks, uh, you know, that, I, that might be good. Like I'm willing to experiment with and see what's what do my, my research, you know, uh, uh make my inquiries, uh, play the game, watch the movie before, uh, you know, before you make your judgments about it. Um, and it was a solid gaming experience when there were things to do. Uh, farming the world bosses was really cool, uh, especially once you were able to, um, one, survive the world bosses, and two, 
farm them when you were the only one there and you were like, oh, I know the secret to this one. I can, I can see if we can get some legendaries from this. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and whatnot. Um, it's actually, it was, a, it's a decent game. Um, my problem has always been, um, beyond the grinding that you can do as a hardcore gamer, not hardcore, like as in your character dies, and like on, on death, like, you know, your character, like, wipes upon death but like you know the characters that are in it for the paragon paragon grind uh and everything that comes with that and uh, the increased difficulty uh and 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 everything like diablo 2 when you had all the ex uh the, the the expanded stuff uh down the line uh and and kudos for for diablo 2 to for still sticking around i think people still play the original version but then there's the resurrected version which i understand is doing very well too um that's staying power for a game i i, I wish uh i wish blizzard would look at diablo 2 really hard and understand what really makes us like the game um, there are a lot of things, um, part of it has to do with nostalgia, like, because, uh, people like me, we played Diablo 1, and then the descent into the church and everything, and wow, that was really cool, and now that, now, you could do that, but you're going off into different worlds, and there's in uh, different like you know environments and, and and countries and whatnot, and um and and there is this much bigger story um, and an extended, st you know what I'm saying? Like it actually, it expanded on the on the Diablo one story instead of just cloning it think that's what it is it's the last time that Diablo or that Blizzard had original content for that game because I don't count Diablo 3 that was bullshit the amount of time you spent on that game and that's the fucking story you give us fuck you Reaper of Souls okay but still Weak overall. Weak. Weak sauce. Weak. So I'm hoping Diablo 4 expands, expands the lore. I didn't really like the story life for Diablo Immortal either. I thought that was like, a, I thought it was just like placeholder fucking content for the game to give you a storyline but it was still at least i didn't hear the name diablo in like direct mention again it's refreshing anyway hi mr shante how you doing tonight Actually, before we, um, you know what? No, 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 no. We'll just jump into it. The Magnus Archives. On the night of the 28th of August, 1859, skies around the, the world that? lit up with spectacular displays of light. In some places, the heavens glowed red, as though reflecting a massive wildfire. Elsewhere, broad bands of white light were seen dancing across the night sky. For almost a week, skies around the world glowed so brightly that it was possible to read a newspaper at midnight. 
Everywhere, people gathered and gazed upwards, terrified and awestruck in equal measure. The vast majority had no idea of what they were witnessing, and could only assume that it was a portent of the end of the world. Reports exist from many different countries of the strange phenomena that could be seen during the week which followed the 28th of August, 1859. In Boston, the sky glowed red to such a degree that many who witnessed it believed that there was a fire burning over the horizon, at least until the red transmuted to a vivid green. Elsewhere, witnesses reported seeing columns of light moving across the sky, and spoke of multicoloured rays and arches forming, coalescing and disintegrating. Yep. One account in the San Francisco right. Herald ran as follows. I've got to follow tradition. The whole sky appeared it must to be an observed. something like a field of grain in a high wind. The waters of the bay reflected the brilliant hues of the aurora. Nothing could exceed the grandeur and beauty of the sight. The effect was almost bewildering, and was witnessed with mingled feelings of awe and delight by thousands. <coughs> Such was the Excuse brightness me. of these lights My that apologies. many people rose from their beds, thinking that dawn had arrived. A group of masons in South Carolina got up and started work on a job site before realizing that it was still the middle of the night and going back home. In Virginia, a railroad conductor, angered by the sound of larks singing as though it was morning, when in fact it was only just 1 a.m., got out his pistol and shot three birds dead so that he could get back to sleep. Oh, shit. At the same time, in Ohio, the sight of the night sky illuminated like a Christmas tree proved too much for one 16-year-old girl. Over the course of the week-long event, she became increasingly agitated, believing that the strange lights heralded the end of the world. She was ultimately committed to an insane asylum. It's not nice. At the same time as the heavenly light show was sending the general population into a frenzy of fear and wonder, telegraph operators around the world were also experiencing bizarre and unexpected difficulties. Something was wrong with their equipment. In some places, telegraph operators received electric shocks and burns when they touched their telegraph keys, or witnessed sparks and arcing from telegraph wires. Elsewhere, operators discovered, much to their surprise, that they could unhook their batteries and still continue to transmit messages. Operators on the American telegraph line between Boston and Portland after briefly marvelling that they could work without batteries, went about their business sending the messages of the day as normal, batteries disconnected. Holy shit. Newspapers during the week of the event were dominated by accounts of the lights in the sky and the disruption of the telegraph system. In some cases, this was all that could be printed, since interruption of telegraph services meant that no news dispatches from the wider world had come in. All in all, these events defied explanation, leaving many to speculate that they were signs of the coming apocalypse. The actual explanation was rather less catastrophic, and would be uncovered by the report of a British amateur astronomer, Richard Harrington. On the 1st of September, 1859, he was in his private observatory on his estate just outside London, Busily monitoring sunspots. Oh, as you can see, sunspots my um, my telescope on my estate. Sun, and Carrington had devoted a great deal of time to tracking their movements, as he believed that their importance was only just beginning to be understood. Mm -hmm. While he was busy with his work, Carrington witnessed something unusual. Two patches of intense white light appeared on the surface of the sun flared briefly and then disappeared. Intrigued, Carrington made a drawing to capture his observations, something he would later send to the Royal Astronomical Society as part of a complete report. 
Although he didn't know it at the time, Carrington had just witnessed two in a series of solar flares. Solar flares are violent events on the surface of the sun, which are almost always accompanied by the ejection of a huge quantity of energetic particles. Of course, the sun constantly emits a solar wind of such particles. Usually, we are completely protected from these by the Earth's own magnetic field. This field stops radiation from the solar wind from harming us, and prevents it from degrading the atmosphere. Only a tiny amount of the material delivered by solar winds can penetrate our atmosphere. Because of the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field, this is most likely to happen at the North and South Poles something which results in the phenomenon we know as Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. During solar flares, the sun releases much more material than usual, a huge belch of magnetized plasma. When this is directed towards the Earth, Aurora Borealis becomes visible far beyond the poles. The solar flares witnessed by Carrington had just sent another massive dose of magnetized plasma on its way towards Earth. That evening, the terrifying and awe-inspiring lights of the sky would be seen again around the world. Send it would be some time, of course, before Carrington's reports allowed the flares and the bizarre activity in the skies to be linked. When they finally were, it was decided that the event should be named in his honour, the Carrington Event. Carrington would have every reason to be pleased to be remembered in such a way. After all, the Carrington Event made headlines around the world, and while it caused some disruption, it was far from deadly. At the time, it must have seemed a bizarre but momentous scientific discovery not something that would pose any real danger to the world at large. The significance of the Carrington event, however, should not be missed. In 1859, electrical technology was relatively basic, with the telegraph system the only piece of technology in widespread use that was reliant on electrical power. Since then, much much more of the world's infrastructure has come to be dependent on electricity. Which begs the question, what would happen should a Carrington level event occur today? Good question. Like in 1859, it's fairly likely that we'd have some warning when a geomagnetic storm might affect the Earth. Systems currently in place should allow us at least one full day to prepare and the long-term effects of the event would be very much dependent on that preparation. <coughs> a quick and coordinated response would involve taking any system that might be damaged by the event offline for its duration. In this best-case scenario, then, a Carrington-level event would mean a week of severe disruption the world over, but only a week. On the other hand, there is the worst-case scenario wherein we fail to prepare, or where we don't have sufficient warning of an incoming Carrington-level event. This would result in some of the most extensive blackouts ever seen, a simultaneous loss of power, loss of communications, and the failure of most modern technology. Planes would be grounded, hospitals left in the dark, traffic control in cities card-based transactions would be impossible refrigeration would fail banking services would be offline supply chains would crumble the world at large could be thrown back hundreds of years in terms of technology and this wouldn't necessarily be just for the duration of the event if power grids were not taken offline to protect them before the event permanent damage could be caused. Given the scale of some power grids, experts estimate that it could take as long as 10 years to completely recover from a worst-case scenario carrying some level event. Finally, it should also be stressed that it really isn't a question of if, but when. Hmm. 
Estimates vary, but it is thought by many that a Carrington level event might strike the Earth on average once every 150 years. At the time of recording, it has been more than 160 years since the Carrington event. We are, by some measures, overdue. If you enjoyed this, or any of my stories, you'll almost certainly enjoy The Magnus Archives, a horror fiction podcast that was kind enough to sponsor today's video. The premise of The Magnus Archives is simple. Each week features a different case file from the archives of the Magnus Institute, an ancient London-based organisation dedicated to researching the paranormal and the unexplained. These are my favourite parts of each episode. The stories range from dark and creepy to the odd bit of monster horror, and are presented in a way that makes them feel unnervingly real. In addition to that, there's also an ongoing story which grows week by week, following the experiences of several Magnus Institute researchers as they digitise the archives collections, attempting to verify each story as they do. It's extremely well made, superbly creepy, and it's just reached its conclusion after more than 200 episodes, which means that you can binge the whole thing from start to end if you feel like it. I was genuinely thrilled when the Magnus Archives asked if they could sponsor a video, and I'm not the only one who thinks they're an excellent podcast. The show has won multiple awards and has a huge dedicated fan base. If you're into horror fiction at all, this is definitely something worth checking out. To find out more, subscribe or listen for free, search for the Magnus Archives wherever you listen to your podcasts, or visit www.rustyquill.com. Okay, yeah. Um... I thought that was going to be uh, longer, well, like, well, yeah, I thought it was going to be a little bit longer, uh, so, um, let's, um, Okay, so, um, we can new, new, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. Okay, well, actually, um, because, uh, it's not all about, uh, one thing here, um, Maybe after we do uh, Diablo, let's do this one. And top five creepy unsolved mysteries uh, in Warhammer 40k. Uh, I highly recommend you go and check the lore out for that. Uh, uh, that property it is fantastic there's lots of it and there are a lot of videos on it uh it's how i became a fan really i mean i've known about them for a long time but that was all always just like the war gaming community uh youtube has allowed me to actually get into the lore of warhammer uh, 40k and it's really cool so let's do it and this is by wes hammer i'm sure you've probably seen him on um on youtube uh, shorts and whatnot. By the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about five of 40K's creepiest and most obscure mysteries. And this is a franchise that is absolutely chock full of super strange things that have gone unexplained for years or sometimes even decades at a time. We're going to be talking about things like an entire hive world's population that suddenly and mysteriously vanished overnight and left behind some incredibly bizarre and unexplainable evidence to what had happened. A terrifying black star 
that shows up out of nowhere and everyone who sees it turns into a fanatical raving cultist. And some super creepy ancient alien devices that grant their wielder immortality, but eternal life comes at a terrifying price. We're going to be talking about all that and a whole lot more, but before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I've got bills to pay. So it's sponsor time, but what do you think it's going to be? I'm sure you've seen a million of these segments on YouTube before. Do you think it's going to be a VPN service, some type of food delivery, some kind of health supplement? If you said yes to any of those, my friend, I regret to inform you that you are in fact incorrect. It's your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends Come on, man. I played that game. With its super um, it was fun for a while. Amazing eh. graphics, intense PvE boss battles, and literally hundreds of unique champions to collect. No matter how many new characters get added to the game, nobody forgets their first champion. And for me, that was my man, Gallic. He's an absolute power. I remember, I had he him. He carried me through a lot of really tough fights, including a couple of wins in the arena. Not to mention helping me absolutely wreck a lot of dungeons. I've unlocked a ton of champions over the last year, but I'll never forget my battles with this guy. And if you didn't know, it's actually Raid's fourth anniversary, and there's a ton to get excited about. I'm talking dedicated offers, free gifts, promo codes, and a brand new fusion event. I was in the Summoner's War more. I had a monstrous also be able to account with it, in, in that game. A video of your stats in Raid. Oh yeah, in the next Amazon Prime drop, it's going to have a ton of powerful gear for the champion Genbo. It'll be available from March 2nd till March 30th, so keep your eyes open. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming to Raid, so if you haven't started playing yet, then now's the perfect time. Use my link in the description, or scan my QR code here on the screen to get some insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion, Kellen the Shrike, and other useful things like energy refills, magic potions, and XP brews. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep on coming. Brand new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday mm. gifts. Once you're in game and after clicking on the links, just enter promo code 4 years raid to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes, plus some other super useful stuff. It'll all be waiting for you right here. Big thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video. Number 5. Colmus, the Tyrant Star Warhammer 40k is no stranger to prophecies. Now, whether they be chaotic, xenos, or even human in nature, there are tons of examples of ancient prophecies that foretell a great far-off apocalypse. One lesser known of these prophecies speaks of the engulfing darkness that will ultimately devour all of human civilization. It's detailed in a manuscript the Inquisition refers to as the Prophetica Hereticus Tenebrae. This event is said to be heralded by all manner of signs that will gradually transmute human minds and make them ready to embrace eternal darkness. The origin of the prophecy is currently a mystery to us as the audience, as it is said to be held within the Bastion Serpentis archives, and none but Lord Inquisitor Zerbe are permitted to study it. The Inquisition has a lot of different theories on the nature of this prophecy, some claiming that it is clearly chaotic in nature, whereas others point out that the word devour shows up pretty often in the text. We don't know what species pinned this prophecy, but if it was the Eldar, then the word devour is used by them pretty frequently in reference to the Tyranids. Comus itself is said to be either a black sun or a halo of black flame, a herald of the encroaching darkness, represented in the text itself by, as of this moment, an unknown rune that bears a striking resemblance to the clawed foot of a bird. The symbol has never been seen in any other text, so we don't really know its origins. On one hand, we might be able to write this off as a spooky prophecy from some unknown ancient Xeno species that all but certainly has gone extinct. But not so fast, as the Calexis sector has been plagued by a bizarre reoccurring phenomena over the last century, a monstrous black sun, matching the descriptions in the text, suddenly and mysteriously appearing out of nowhere in various locations throughout the sector. No two appearances have ever been quite the same, but there are definitely discernible patterns that link them all together. In most cases, a ghostly star emanating black flames and esoteric unknown radiations spontaneously materializes within a planetary system. The thing shines malevolently for a few days and then mysteriously vanishes without a trace. Sometimes the black star appears alongside a planet's normal one, and sometimes it eclipses it entirely. The phenomena has been documented at least 18 times, but it's believed to have occurred far more than that. Sometimes the sun's showing up in far more subtle ways, like in the reflection of a wine glass, or only visible at night as a dark spot that's blacker than the night sky itself. The Tyrantine Cabal of the Inquisition firmly believes that the spectral sun phenomena is, without a doubt, the Tyrant Star Comos mentioned in the prophecy, as it very closely matches its description. 
However, there are some competing theories on what this thing actually is. Some say that it is a ghostly image of a stellar body within the immaterium trying to shine through the fabric of real space. In a similar vein, some say the star is within the warp itself and is partially translating into the physical universe, as if it is trying to find a way through. There are others still, even within the Inquisition, that claim that it is a Xenos artificial construct, a weapon of unknown origins that is incomprehensible to mankind. Whatever its origins, every single time the star appears, its visitation has caused public unrest and geological instability. For months before it shows up, a planet will experience unnatural earthquakes and volcanic upsurges. The social fabric of the world will begin to deteriorate as a psychic madness infects the planet's population. There will be uncontrolled rioting, looting, and uprisings of dozens if not hundreds of distinct fanatical cults. Multitudes more psychers will either be born or become active during this time, and mutation will run rampant throughout society. The signs of the star's coming will be widespread, taking the form of bizarre yet identical birthmarks appearing on newborns, and odd runic symbols appearing on walls without explanation. The population will begin to see the sun itself in their nightmares, and will even be haunted by unexplained visions of the sun's reflection in mirrors, pools, and puddles. If the Inquisition is to be believed, then after the sun disappears, many of these worlds will eventually return to business as normal. The strange celestial phenomenon bearing no connection to any of the events the planet had to endure. However, the Inquisition seems determined to track each one of these visitations, and has worked tirelessly to carefully suppress any official confirmation of the sun's existence. Only time will tell if the tyrant star really is the herald of humanity's downfall, or just another instance of unexplained phenomena. Number four, the howling. Throughout 40K's extensive lore, we find little snippets here and there that show us just how horrifying the galaxy really is. There are creatures that lurk in the dark places between stars that are not only ludicrously powerful, but also horrifically malevolent in their intent. The truly baffling thing to me as a 40K fan is that many of these documented sightings of such terrifying entities often equate to little more than a footnote in the Imperium's history, an obscure piece of lore that is given little to no attention. One such instance was known as the Howling, where an alien cyborg psyker of unknown origin, known only as the Cacodominus, demonstrated ludicrously powerful and manipulative psychic abilities. It was able to exert complete and utter control over every living thing in a massive area that contained around 1,300 planetary systems. This would make it one of the most powerful psychic entities we have ever witnessed within the physical universe. What sinister purpose it had for dominating the minds of the untold billions of these worlds is currently unknown, but its reign of domination would inevitably come to an end when it was slain by the Black Templars in the 34th millennium. Its vengeance would come in the form of an immense psychic backlash, an alien scream that reverberated through the warp, growing in power with every subsequent echo. This creature's psychic death scream was so powerful that it managed to burn out the minds of a billion astropaths within its blast radius, and Jesus. not to mention distort the signal of the Astronomicon itself all the way back on Terra. Millions upon millions of ships were lost in the resulting chaos, and it was said that entire subsectors were completely taken over by rampant barbarism as their societies descended into madness without the wisdom of the Adeptus Terra to guide them. In my research, I've only been able to find a handful of mentions of this event. The first coming from the 5th edition 40k rulebook, and the second coming from the 8th edition Space Marines Codex. Other than that, we're really not given a lot more insight into it. What exactly was this thing? Was it a one-off creation, a freak abnormality, or a harbinger of a viciously powerful yet undocumented Xeno species? The idea that there could be more of these things out there is truly terrifying to think of. The legend of the Cacodominus does live on through the Black Templars, as they kept its skull as a relic. And if you're a player of the Warhammer 40k tabletop game, you can actually take this relic on one of your Black Templar characters. Oh, it confers shit. a stacking negative aura to psychic tests, and makes enemy psychers far more likely to suffer perils of the warp, which I thought was pretty neat. Hopefully this is a plotline that Games Workshop decides to revisit sometime in the future. Number 3. The Disappearance of Fornax Aleph Fornax Aleph was the site of one of the most unnerving and inexplicable episodes within the Sabbat World's Crusade. The Hive World had been determined to be an enemy bastion, or one that had a significant fleet reserve and would put up an enormous fight. Nine regiments of the Imperial Guard were set to invade the planet, and it was planned that they would be reinforced by the Iron Snake Space Marine chapter. However, the assault ended up getting delayed twice because of aggressive warp storm activity in the area. 
These warp storms were so bad that the Iron Snake's battle barges were forced into a four-month holding pattern. General Elbeth, serving under Warmaster Slato, was set to command the Imperial Guard units, but his fleets ended up getting scattered by the warp storms, and when he arrived at the planet, he did so with only a third of his complement. To make matters worse, there was no sign of the Iron Snakes that were supposed to be there to support them. Now, Elbeth was a very cautious man and decided to abort the assault run. The forces he had under his control were certainly nothing to scoff at, but they wouldn't be enough to take an entire hive world single-handedly. He moved his fleets to the outer system and decided to hold there until reinforcements arrived. That being said, he didn't want to waste this opportunity, so he directed a rapid pursuit frigate, the Ziegler, to undertake an intruder pass through the inner system. This would be done to assess the enemy strengths and disposition. However, to the general's complete bafflement, the Ziegler encountered zero resistance, and no orbital batteries fired on it, and no ships were launched to engage. The Ziegler even reported that all of the orbital yards were entirely empty of ships, both military and civilian. Most peculiar of all, they detected no electromagnetic activity anywhere on the planet. No Vox substrate, no power industry, no motion of any kind. The great hives of Fornex Aleph appeared to be empty and dead. General Elbeth believed that maybe the population had retreated to the countryside, so over the next several weeks he would deploy many more cruisers to scout out different parts of the planet. All of them, however, came up empty. There was no life that could be detected anywhere on the planet. Elbeth decided to launch a spearhead force instead of waiting for reinforcements, deploying two full regiments of heavy infantry, the 34th and 52nd Fighting Felids. He would also deploy the Vitrian 10th Armored Brigade, which totaled to about 16,000 men and women in 800 fighting vehicles. Much like what happened with the Rapid Pursuit frigates, they met no resistance. The world was entirely devoid of life. It was as if the vast population had suddenly vanished in an instant. There were half-eaten meals on hab tables, unfinished games of regicide in the street parlors. There wasn't even power, but that was admittedly easily restored, showing no indication of sabotage. If the planet had been evacuated, there would surely be unmistakable evidence of this. And if a great plague had taken the population, there would be bodies everywhere. There were, however, no corpses to be found, no burial pits or any sign of struggle or disaster. The entire population had disappeared without explanation leaving behind an eerie, vacant world. Unfortunately, the only thing we really have to go on is the transcribed reports that Elbeth gave back to Warmaster Slato. And those reports indicate that him and the men under his control were incredibly unnerved. Despite the uneasiness they felt, they ended up fortifying their position to wait for reinforcements. The men were getting more and more nervous each and every day. And during the night, they would- Hey viewer, how are you doing today? Chilling screams um... of anguish. Just watching some uh, Warhammer Despite stuff. Search efforts, the source of the screaming was never located. On the first day of 7 Hope you're uh, doing okay this evening. All transmissions from Elbus Liberation Force abruptly ceased. It would be 80 more days after this um, when the Iron Snakes... Getting into the this and then I'm going to hop on Diablo uh, for um, the beta. 300 of them immediately made Planetfall and made their way to Elbus' last recorded position. It was said that the Iron Snakes were a very serious chapter that were not easily disturbed. Excuse but their me. initial contact back to the Warmaster Slato lacked their characteristic demeanor. They seemed to be at a loss for words, their report only saying that there was no one here. There was no evidence that Elbeth and his forces had ever been there. If they had fortified a position, it could not be located. Whatever happened to the planet's population had claimed Elbeth and the men and women under his command as well. The Iron Snakes would spend the next month scouring every single inch of the world for clues to what had happened. For the most part, their search came up disappointingly empty, with one exception. Impossibly, a single Lehman Russ battle tank was discovered 80 stories up on the roof of a hab stack. All of the Vox headsets inside were missing, except for the last 30 centimeters of their cords that had been plugged into the outlets. The cords themselves had been severed and somehow fused at a molecular level. The only human remains that were discovered was a single gauntlet in which a calcified human hand was found still gripping the gearbox lever within the tank. No formal explanation of what happened on this world was ever established, and years later the planet would be repopulated. Now thankfully since then there have been no mysterious mass disappearances or anything like that. Wow. But to this day, the population has continued to report unexplained screams in the dead of night. Number two. Oh, the that's creepy. Of Thanotep. The Labyrinth of Thanotep is a... It's always something to do with a Thanos something, isn't it? 
This infinite prison trammels in being so terrible that not even the Necrons dare to enslave them for war. But what I just read to you is literally all the information on the labyrinth that exists. It was only ever mentioned briefly within the 9th edition Necron Codex, and then subsequently, never even so much as referenced again. So our imaginations are kind of allowed to run wild with this one. I just want to put it into perspective. Out of all of the terrifying things contained within the labyrinth, the Necrons have deemed them too dangerous to be enslaved for war. This is a faction that literally did just that to their gods, like turning against the Catan, mm, shattering them the into Necrons. dozens of fragments, mm. and then subsequently enslaving those fragments and throwing them out on the battlefield like Pokemon. The only difference between the Catan shards and Pokemon is the Catan have the devastating power to completely sunder reality. Yet, whatever lurks within the depths of the labyrinth has these god killers spooked out of their robot minds. The idea that there could be entities out there far older than the Catan, which are said to be as old as the universe itself, and vastly more powerful than them or even the Chaos Gods is not that unheard of. As in the novel Godlight, there's an instance where an Eldari Farseer is talking of the Catan. He calls them the gods of the Materia, and that there are other, more ancient, and even more terrible things out there. Whatever the Eldar was referring to may very well be what the Necrons have contained within the Labyrinth, but that's just me speculating. We really don't have a lot to go on yet. With a lot of the 40k mysteries that exist, we're able to piece together little bits of information from across decades of contributions to the lore. Now whether they take the form of full-fledged novels, campaign books, codexes, white dwarfs, or even the various video games yeah, and audio Necron. that have been released. By piecing all this together, Those we can slowly work our way towards an answer. A lot of the time, however, something will be mentioned briefly and then not acknowledged again by the authors for years or perhaps even decades. Until they decide if you guys to want, we can cover uh, Warhammer lore. lore. There's a lot of really good stuff. Of 40K literature, I think that's what we're seeing with the Labyrinth. Since its first mention was only a few years ago, I feel like it's something that's being set up for a future expansion, but only time will tell if Games Workshop wants to give us any more information on this admittedly cool and spooky place. Number one, the Halo devices. Yeah. The Milky Way galaxy is impossibly ancient, and from the time of its inception, countless different civilizations have risen and fallen. Most of the species that saw themselves as the would-be inheritors of all of creation ended up falling short and were confined to the halls of extinction. Their great empires, succumbing to entropy, every piece of evidence that they had ever even existed, eventually crumbling to dust. For some species, however, their great work endured long after the echoes of their existence returned to nothingness. Sometimes these took the form of ancient alien ruins that denied the passage of time and stood defiantly for millions of years and most of them serve as a superficial reminder that nothing lasts forever, whereas others seem to have been designed with a synthetic malevolence, perilous devices of inhuman knowledge and unknown purpose that concede corruption, twist the soul, befoul the mind, and profane the sacred human form. One such artifact is what is known by the rogue traders and the Inquisition as the Halo devices, incredibly dangerous constructs of unknown alien origin that have been long forbidden to mankind. Despite the terrifying and dark nature of these constructs, and many would still seek them out for the false gifts they promise, it doesn't matter what terrifying price they demand, as they offer something that all of humanity has craved since we first crawled our way out of the primordial ooze. Immortality. The Halo device gets its name from the region of space known as the Halo Stars where they were first discovered. They were found on lifeless alien worlds that orbited dead stars. Some resembling smooth talismans, while others are orbs filled with an unknown fluid. There was even one reported case of a halo device that resembled a living worm-like creature. All of them are glossy and smooth to the touch, and defy analysis by Auspex scanners. They are impervious to harm, and despite their impossible age, show no evidence that time has any effect on them. It's generally agreed upon that the worlds in which the devices were found were once part of a great and ancient civilization. But as they left nothing but the devices behind, we really don't know much about them, and perhaps never will. When one of these devices bonds with a human, it will increase their strength, knowledge, and reaction time exponentially. They will be granted youth, vigor, and undying power. But what makes them so horrifying is that this all comes at a terrifying cost. You see, the device will end up possessing their body and mind, <laughs> twisting their thoughts towards strange, deranged thirst. Over time, their life becomes not their own, being completely dominated by the device, like a sick puppet of flesh. Whether or not the disturbing effects the Halo devices seem to have on human beings was by design or simply a byproduct of them integrating with a biological species they were never designed to, is still unknown. 
if these morbid effects were intentional, then it would indicate that the creators had an evil, callous genius that would put even the homunculi of the Dark Eldar to shame. There was one recorded instance of a Halo device being used by the head of a powerful mercantile house. A Lord Inquisitor would deem the heretic so reviled that his name and all accounts of his deeds were to be expunged from Imperial records. I mean, what if those those worlds are dead and those devices are the only things there for a reason? Like, uh, they are tomb worlds now, like, uh, with grim reminders to leave them the fuck alone. You know, like, damn, like, damn. When he was discovered, he had become a grotesque fusion of polluted human flesh and Xenos artifacts. The later becoming so much part of him that it was impossible to tell where one began and the other. He was right ended. there, he right there in the center of his of fucking gullet. Powers and could not die. Now we don't know much about what exactly he was capable of, but it was said that his sins were so grievous and disturbing to the Inquisition that they ordered the execution of not just him, but of every living person within his house and all of the house's vassals as well. Oh, they were wow. so afraid of this guy that his execution came in the form of him literally being thrown into the planetary system's sun. <laughs> the transformation induced <laughs> by a becomes more pronounced over time. And yeah. can we separate... Bro, um, <laughs> we're not sure if we have anything that can kill you. But we know one thing that kills pretty much anything that fucking gets put into its vicinity. So, oh yeah, woof. <laughs> into three distinct phases. It takes a few weeks for the device to fully bond with its user's flesh, and after that point, there is no way to remove it without killing the host. Their form will rejuvenate to the peak of youth and health. Any physical diseases, deformities, or mutations will be negated, and any part of the body that had been lost, like a severed limb, will miraculously regrow. As their physical Andy. body begins to grow ah. more powerful, their mind will start to degrade. At first, they'll realize that they no longer find pleasure in normal sensory stimuli. As they lose their sense of smell, and food will begin to taste like ash in their mouth. The host will begin to suffer violent mood swings, and as time progresses, they will find that they no longer require a full night's rest, only a few hours of sleep every couple of weeks, in which they will be haunted by terrifying alien dreams of strange dead cities beneath dark stars. Phase two happens after a period of a couple of years, where the device will have fully implemented itself into the host's body, becoming partially absorbed at a cellular level. The point on their body where the device originally made contact will have been healed over by new skin. The initial bonding location will twist with hardening scar tissue, resembling something like a tough exoskeleton of an insect. By this point, the host's muscular and skeletal systems will have twisted in such a way that they are inhumanly fast, strong, and resilient. They no longer sleep at all, eat or drink normal food. But as their mind descends further into the Halo device's synthetic madness, they will begin to develop strange addictions and insatiable hungers. In order to keep up their appearance and strength, these hungers will have to be regularly indulged, or they will begin to grow increasingly unstable and sickly. These addictions can come in the form of spending long isolated periods in total darkness, or immersion in solar radiation. Their hunger can take a lot of different forms, but most commonly, it comes in the need to feast on human flesh, the drinking of blood and wow. cranial fluids. Their minds will further contort to the point that their memories begin to be replaced with those of things they have never witnessed, such as... Like I said, if this is what happened, then those worlds are dead. Because whoever was like, a, like, and you know, it's, it, 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 there's always stupid people that want power, right? So, you have one dude that fucking eat, eats his whole fucking family or fucking like eats his dynasty or like a city and everybody forgets about it and their ghost stories, whatnot and everything. And then some fucking curious person or some... Uh, uh, treasure hunters or somebody just trying to fucking reclaim territory. It could be anything. They go in and they find the shiny object and and it starts promising them immortality and power and then all of a sudden the cycle starts over again until you know, 
something worse happens. This is the 40k universe. See, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's this, this universe is really, really cool and terrifying because, like, it gives, uh, like, it, 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 it defines the, the, the genre grim dark. Like, there is no sunlight here. And when it, when there is sunlight, it's, it's, it's usually trying to fry you to an ever loving crisp. Um, so, yeah. Zombies! Ah! Strange alien civilizations, insights into heretical lore, and unknown languages. There are even some reports that if a person at this phase ends up getting Hello, killed, but their body was not completely destroyed at the cellular level, they, over time, will resurrect as they begin to stitch themselves back together. In the few instances wow. this was documented, the individual was driven into full-blown insanity. Phase 3 occurs after a host has been in contact with the device over multiple decades. At this point, there is no longer any separation between the user and the Halo device. They still resemble a humanoid, but their humanity has been completely stripped away. Now, documented individuals that have proceeded to this stage are noted as having a corpse-like flesh, burning eyes, distorted gaunt features, armor-like hides, and even fingers that have fused into long talons of exposed bone. Their strength will have advanced to the point where the host can rip a full-grown man's head clean from their shoulders with barely any effort. A host in Phase 3 is said to be able to survive the void of space and can regenerate from death remarkably quickly. Their mind that had once been bordering the whirlpool of madness has now completely descended. So, do the, the so did that no that guy that got yeeted into the sun, did the device come out the other side and fucking is floating in space uh, waiting for another victim? To seek these devices out and sell them under the counter each one would fetch an absolutely exorbitant price, as the rumors of these devices mostly begin and end with the promise of eternal youth, due to the Inquisition's relentless efforts to cover up their existence. If a would-be buyer does know anything of their more terrifying side effects, they may view this as a price worth paying. However, Seriously? the state of these things is not only utterly illegal, but an unforgivable heresy. The Inquisition views the Halo devices as an immediate threat to the Imperium's stability yeah. and thus has declared war on them and anyone who has ever even remotely come into contact with the blasphemous alien technology. They constantly scour the Kalexis sector for any rogue traders that would attempt to secure them or sell them in underground markets. Anyone found to have come into contact with a Halo device will be eradicated without mercy. As the years go by, more and more of these devices are unearthed. And how many of them are currently out there in circulation is currently unknown. But considering the Inquisition has so far been unsuccessful at containing their plague of madness, it seems like an undeniable conclusion that they will eventually spread throughout the entirety of the Imperium. And the amount of damage they'll be able to do is incalculable. And that was five of the creepiest and most obscure 40k mysteries. Which one was your favorite? Which one did you find the spookiest? Is there anything else you found in this franchise that you find super creepy and you'd love to hear me talk about it? Then let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you've been watching my channel for a while, then you know that I genuinely read just about everything y'all post, and one of my favorite things to do is to hang out in the comments section and nerd out about 40k with y'all. If you've made it this far in the video and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, then what, what are you even doing? Come on, come on and join the West Hammer Party. I'm going to be posting a lot more cool stuff like this, and I don't want you to miss out on it. And while you're at it, go ahead and roll the charge that like button. Big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one. Um, and, um... In remembrance of Mr. Lance Reddick, I present to you... Congratulations. It's time to call Mom and Dad. Tell them that the second mortgage they took out for your degree was worth it because you now have a job. But a job, not a career. No, 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 no. A job is just a foot in the door. If you want a career, if you want to be standing where I'm standing 15 years from now, then you had better listen very fucking carefully to the next 176 words out of my mouth because this is your new reality. When you walk through that door each and every morning, your ass is mine. There will be no cell phones. There will be no smoke breaks. There will be no conversation and putting into the job. There will be no motherfucking shits taken unless authorized by me personally. And if you happen to be lucky enough to get that authorization, 
You will have exactly four minutes and 30 seconds to expel your fecal material, wipe your ass and wash your filthy hands and get back to work. And if I happen to come across a shit smear in the toilet bowl of that employee restroom, I will personally go to each and every one of your homes and shit in places that will leave you confused for the rest of your lives. Excellence. I expect it. I demand it and I deliver it. And there's really only one thing you need to know. This ain't Toys R Us, motherfuckers. This is Toys R Me. What the fuck is this? Uh, it's the Bakugan display you asked me to set up. Imagine if you can, that you are a proud and powerful Bakugan. Can you do that? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Imagine it. <laughs> okay. Good. Now, you tell me, what a Gargano would call this a Bakugan display? Or what a Gogano would call this a bitter insult to his race, not worth shitting on for all the savory dream crystals in the lavender cloud dimension. No, the goddamn toys and show them some fucking respect! exactly 15 seconds to finish whatever the hell it is you're doing in there or I will kick in this fucking door and drag your ass out. Do you hear me? Can you chill out? I'm on my period. No, you're not. <laughs> this toy store sucks. It's not even any Xbox game. Have you ever heard the story of the rich old man and the stray dog? No. Sounds happy. There was once a very old man, and one day he came across a stray dog. Well, he decided to take that dog home with him, and that dog went straight to the fire and rolled himself up in an old rug and started chewing in an old ball. Over the years, the old man bought the dog lots of expensive beds, lots of expensive meals, much better than most people get to eat. But that dog always went back to the room in that old ball because he knew that that was all he really needed. Now, who do you think you are in this story? Let me guess. The rich old man who didn't know that happiness comes from the simple things in life? No, you are the runny shit the dog would take every morning because he had canine colitis from living on the street so long. <laughs> now get the fuck out of my store. Wow. You know, I've noticed your work around here. Really? Yes. Very impressive. Wow. Uh, thank you. You know, if you keep this up, you could find yourself riding high on the hog in no time. A race? Really? No. No, hog is what I call my penis. Oh, wow, dude. Wow. Toy. Ah. Me. Toy. Ah. Me. Toy. Ah. <laughs> we are all thinking we are all thinking the same thing. I guess a free plug for Funny or Die. Uh, are they still around? <coughs> oh, man. Maybe we'll come back to this. That's 45 minutes long. We do have a number of hours to fill out, though. Um... Yeah. 
the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about 10 of Warhammer 40k's <laughs> characters. And let me tell you, this list was not easy to put together, as 40k is a franchise that is well-renowned for its sheer level of brutality, and on occasion, elements, stories, and characters that are so unnecessarily dark that they become just a, just a tad bit ridiculous. But, you know, like in a fun way. We're going to be taking a look at a predatory alien creature that snatches its victims from the shadows and then learns all of their secrets by devouring their brain. A Primarch that is so ridiculously evil that pretty much everything that's gone wrong in the franchise can at least in some way trace its origins back to him. And not to mention several different mad scientists that each like to expose their victims to all manner of horrifying experiments. At the end of the day, whether or not somebody finds something dark, disturbing, or scary is all subjective. So this is my personal list. And in order to keep it interesting, I tried to vary up the factions that I talk about. Because otherwise, if I'm being honest, this would have just been a list of the top 10 most messed up dark Eldar characters. Anyways, Yo, they can be really sponsor, fucked up too. They, they, they the like Grimdark. torture a whole lot. You might lot. not know this, but the most time consuming thing when it comes to making lore videos is doing an absolutely well, metric ton deeper of than research. That. And when I say a ton of research, I mean a ton. Fresh, During fresh the day, crafting I mostly and all stick to PDFs and physical books. But at night, I turn into a super efficient multitasker by listening to a ton of audiobooks with my Raycon earbuds. That way, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's working out, doing chores, cooking, whatever, I can still be learning about my favorite fictional universes. Fun fact, I fall asleep every single night using my Raycons to listen to some good old fashioned grimdark stories. Which honestly, now that I think about it, kind of explains a lot. Getting good quality earbuds is not something that should be prohibitively expensive. You know, like other things that myself and people who watch this- I used to sport that hairstyle when I was losing my hair back when I was still trying to look like I had hair. Channel may or may not be obsessed with. Just saying. Which is why I love Raycon so much. Not only are you getting some top tier earbuds with fantastic audio quality, but you're getting them at the most competitive prices out there, as they start at half the price of other premium audio brands and sound just as good. With Raycon, you get premium sounding audio quality without breaking the bank. Whether you're looking for a pair of everyday earbuds, low latency gaming headphones, or a speaker with a battery that will last all night, Raycon's got you covered. They have a 32 hour battery life and offer eight hours of continuous playtime. They have everything you could possibly want in a pair of premium earbuds, a customizable sound profiles, crystal clear call quality, and they're even water and sweat resistant. Raycon even offers easy and free returns with every purchase. So you can feel confident in your decision to buy a set of these amazing earbuds. I'm confident you'll love them as much as I do. Ready to buy something small with a big impact? Then click on the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash Westhammer to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Big thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Number 10, Tiberius the Red Wake. Although Tiberius fights for the Imperium, all those who have witnessed him in battle will attest he is a frighteningly terrifying monster. He is the Red Wake, the Shade Lord, and the Chapter Master of the Carcharodon, a chapter that was already known for its particularly brutal style of warfare. As a nomadic fleet-based chapter with no homeworld, they prowl the void like a pack of hungry sharks, drawn to the most brutal of war zones by the scent of fresh blood. No call for reinforcements is ever issued, no requests from other chapters, and yet they appear where they are needed to carve a gore-soaked path through all those that would threaten the Imperium of Mankind. They tend to favor jagged, serrated, or chain weaponry that will inflict as much visceral damage as possible, tearing through enemy ranks in a shower of gore, eviscerating all that would stand in their way. The Red Wake is no exception to this, and perhaps exemplifies the Krakardon's savage tactics better than any of his brothers. Tiberius is a giant, even amongst other Astartes, towering over his brothers in a heavily augmented suit of tactical dreadnought armor. Now, despite his enormous size, the Red Wake is said to move so quickly in battle, it's nearly impossible to track him with the naked eye. Mm. He is a blur of flensing claws and unrestrained butchery. He is a blood-drenched killing machine that cleaves his way through the enemy ranks, leaving mountains of shredded and mangled corpses in his wake. On both of his hands is an artificer power gauntlet each of which is equipped with an oversized retractable lightning claw. The claws are named Hunger and Slake, and have been stained red with the blood of countless enemies. The hunger for the blood of the enemies of the Emperor, and the slaking in the spilling of it. Not many have seen the naked face of the Red Wake, but to those who have, they say it is a visage of pure terror. The face of death itself, 
It is a pale, jagged nightmare of deep scars and exposed bones, with jagged teeth that hunger for prey. If that wasn't disturbing enough for an Imperial Astartes, there are even rumors circulating that the pair of lightning claws he wields are the very same one that were owned by the Primarch of the Night Lords, Conrad Kurz. Though, as of right now, those whispers remain just rumors. Number 9. Lorgar On a bit more of a personal note, mm. the thing I find most horrifying when I'm reading, watching, or playing any form of scary media is the concept of fanaticism. It's kind of terrifying when you think about it. The fact that someone can have complete and profound belief that what they are doing is right, no matter how horrific their actions are or how much pain they inflict on others, while simultaneously lacking the ability to be reasoned with on any level. Spanish Inquisition! <laughs> can't change the subject. In my opinion, fanatics are far scarier than any ghost, ghoul, or Dracula. Sure, a single fanatic is scary enough, but if left unchecked or given a position of power, that individual can become a demigod. Through their charismatic words, the individual becomes a group, which in turn becomes a mob, and then eventually into a full-blown cult, an army of deranged lunatics, see? See? ready to see? burn down everything you've ever loved in the name of some utterly alien cause. Reason, logic, empathy, and understanding, all these things are sacrificed on the proverbial altar in exchange for an echo chamber where their fanatics' own twisted ideals echo back and forth through their ranks, growing louder and more deranged with each subsequent echo. The fanatics will then propel... Fallout New Vegas is the best. Fallout New Vegas is the best, and it will always be that way. Fallout New Vegas is the best. Whether the cult be based in hedonistic and debased orgies of excess, or self-righteous puritanical tyranny, it ultimately doesn't matter what the that game too. takes, I, I already as the got damage it. such um, individuals can inflict is without limits. Apparently I've had it, it for a while. It doesn't matter how charismatic, righteous, intelligent, or kind you are. There is no reasoning with the mob, no debating the cult. You're either a believer or a heretic, and all heretics must be purged. It's probably why to this day that one scene in The Mist, where the one nut job radicalizes all of the survivors trapped in the grocery store and convinces them to sacrifice one of their friends to the eldritch horrors lurking outside, it ranks as one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in a horror movie in a long time. And it's also why the word bearers, and more specifically, their Primarch Lorgar, are so deeply horrifying to me. I'll eventually get around to doing a deep dive on him, but for the moment, as a brief introduction to the character, Lorgar is the Primarch of the Space Marine Legions known as the Wordbearers. He was a deeply religious person, raised by the priest Corferon on his homeworld of Colchis. By the time he would come to take his place with the Emperor's Imperium and lead the Wordbearers in the Great Crusade, he had fully dedicated himself to worshipping the Emperor as the one true god, something that completely went against everything that the Emperor stood for. Now despite this, for unknown reasons the Emperor allowed this to continue for a time, until the Wordbearers began to fall behind in their tally of conquered worlds. You see, a portion of the word bearers would choose to stay behind on each of the worlds they came to, molding the population until they had completely dedicated themselves to the worship of the Emperor. Now, this obviously left many of the worlds they visited to be some of the most fiercely loyal that had been recaptured in the Great Crusade, but their efficiency overall had certainly fallen behind. The Emperor decided that he had had enough, and chastised Lorgar and the word bearers by bombing Lorgar's prized city of Monarchia, a city that had become the epicenter of Emperor worship. The physical and symbolic act of the god figure smiting all those that worshipped him was not lost on Lorgar. Although he swore to cease worship, the need for a god was too deeply ingrained in him, and he would set off on a pilgrimage to find beings truly worthy of his devotion. He would inevitably find the Chaos Gods. Now this was the beginning of the Horus Heresy, as chaos and corruption were allowed to spread and fester throughout the word bearers, and then eventually through the other legions as well. When the heresy was in full swing, Lorgar was a deeply disturbed individual. All of the grisly and horrifying acts of genocide him and his legion committed were ultimately justified by the ruinous powers, as they were the primordial truth of the universe. Every murder, every betrayal, every act of sustained blasphemy was viewed by the mad Primarch as noble and righteous. And to me, that utter conviction, the supreme unshakable belief in what you are doing is correct, despite the grotesque aftermath left in the wake of every action there's a game, lot of real world that analogs someone for that could be so depraved as to decorate their flagship with the crucified bodies of sacrificial citizens or view the murder of an entire world as righteous an act to be celebrated the idea that somebody could be so utterly insane 
yet do all of this with a smile on their face, plagued by delusions of grandeur and enraptured by holy fervor, is unbelievably terrifying to me. It is one of 40k's deepest ironies that it was Lorgar who penned the Lectitio Divinitatis, the holy book that proclaimed the emperor as the one true god of humanity, a book that in the 42nd millennium is venerated by the imperial cult and set the foundations for the imperial creed. This is a passage from the novel Betrayer, where Lorgar was trying to get Magnus of the Thousand Sons to understand and appreciate what he was trying to do, and ultimately get Magnus to dedicate himself fully to the heresy. For reference, this conversation happens right after the events of Cal, one of the Ultramarine's worlds that the word bearers would invade and slaughter millions of people. The way he speaks of the warp gives me chills every time I read it. He speaks in equal parts fascination and terror. Kalf is the syncopated backbeat to the song, the rhythm beneath the rhyme. That much fire, that much misery, that much pain. The suffering has always fueled the warp in random stains and stigmata. And now we learn the virtue of control. Can you hear it? Can you hear the pain stirring the tides? Can you hear the crash of those waves, Magnus? Can you hear how those black tides beat a million hearts bursting out loud, as rhythmic as drums in the deep cold? The tide of the Sea of Souls can be altered by mortal hands, brother. Listen, listen. We're reordering the warp itself, Magnus, changing it through pain. We're rewriting the song. There, a ship burns in Latona's atmosphere, the cries of the doomed souls echoing into the Empyrean. And there, a warship plows into the surface of Ulixis, digging its own grave, taking a hundred thousand souls shrieking into the afterlife. Do you hear them dying, Madness? Do you hear the song shifting in time to their extinguished essences? Every life, every death, every cry of pain across these burning worlds thins the veil between reality and the first realm. Call it the Hades or Hell, Jahannam, Naraka, the Underworld, call it the world, call it whatever you will. <coughs> I am bringing it forth onto the material plane. Kalth was the genesis of the storm, Magnus. I will make an entire subsector suffer enough that the curtain falls and the 500 worlds drown in the warp. Tell me you can feel it. Tell me you can hear the million, million demons shrieking and baying, desperate to be born upon these burning worlds. Whether or not you're a fan of Lorgar's character comes down to personal mm. taste, but there's no denying that his super dark conviction is definitely creepy. Number eight, the Lictor. Despite the fact that you've probably seen a lot of different Lictors throughout the lore, and if you're a Tyranid player, you've probably fielded several of them at once in the 40k tabletop game. It's important to remember that all Tyranids are the same organism. Every Lictor that has ever lived is the Lictor, each one containing the memories, experience, and evolutionary advantage of every Lictor body that had come before. The Lictor is the apex of evolution, a perfect killing machine honed over countless millennia. They act as scouts for the Tyranid Swarm, moving ahead of the High Fleet's advance and gathering crucial intel. They locate pockets of resistance and determine any and all weak points within an enemy's structures. They are solitary predators that prefer to hunt from the shadows, picking off key targets one by one, leaving the survivors with an overwhelming feeling of dread, knowing they are completely helpless against the unseen enemy. It's seemingly random and utterly lethal attack patterns, so dismay and terror throughout the ranks of its enemies. In some extreme examples, leading to a complete breakdown of the enemy's morale and command structures, as the prey begins to accept the inevitability that it is only a matter of time before the Lictor comes for them. This has given the Lictor a particularly fearsome reputation amongst members of the Guard. They are remarkably patient hunters that can maintain perfectly still and undetected for days, weeks, or even months on end, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. When that time comes, they are horrendously efficient and are equipped with an entire arsenal of bioweaponry used to quickly eliminate and dismember their targets as quickly and quietly as possible. For example, the feeder tendrils that hang from a lictor's mouth are strong enough to penetrate their prey's eyes, drilling directly into the brain cavity and then being used to quickly devour its brain while it's still alive. Through the consumption of its wow. brain tissue, it is able to learn everything the individual knew in life 
key command posts, military secrets, and any and all information that would be beneficial to the Hive's attack. This is a passage from the Devastation of Maul that follows a Lictor that has moved behind enemy lines and is scouting out the Blood Angel's defenses for the incoming Hive fleet. The Lictor looked like a creature unto itself. It moved as a solitary organism. It had operated on its own for years, far away from the Hive fleet, but it was not apart from the Hive mind. That was the mistake the Prey always made. Even at this corpuscular level, it was a mistake to see the Lictor as a Lictor. One of millions. There were not many. There was one. The Lictor was the Lictor. Every iteration was a copy, better than perfect for eons of improvement, party to the actions, mistakes, and successes of every other Lictor that had come before. Welded to the very genes of its being were untold millions of years of experience. It was on ball just as it was simultaneously on a thousand other worlds throughout the galaxy. It put ancient lessons into action. Sight was the easiest sense to fool. The Lictor moved at night when it was harder to see. Chromatic microscales lent it near-perfect chameleonic ability, even in the full light of day. Deformable organ clusters embedded in its skin allowed it to change its shape somewhat, enabling it to take on the rough texture of stone or mimic fronds of vegetation. Smell was a more primal sense, harder to deceive because of it. The Lictor managed that too. It had virtually no scent, only when it flooded the air with pheromone trails to guide its kin beast did its emissions become noticeable. By then, it was too late. And most prey could hear, so it made no sound when it moved. Special arrangements of hair baffled the whispers of its limbs moving over one another, and more esoteric senses were equally well accounted for. Its electromagnetic profile was minimal. Its brain case was shielded by eternal bone structures against energy leakage. The nerves in its body were similarly cloaked. Its hooves were shaped to make the minimum of vibration. And although it could not entirely stop the perturbation of the air made by its movements, its chitinous plates were fluted in precise molecular fractal patterns to minimize its wake. It gave off no heat. It shed no cells and less damaged. Its psychic link with the hive mind was like spider silk, gossamer thin, strong, and almost impossible to detect. More adaptations heaped on top of more. Unlike a natural organism who loses certain gifts in favor of others as evolution pushes it down a particular path, the Lictor's advantages were retained. New gifts stacked atop the others. Its genetic structure was incredibly complex. Within every cell was billions of years worth of adaptation, culled from every Lictor, coiled up one over the other. Anything useful to its role, and no matter how inconsequentially seeming, it retained forever. Every machine and psychic ability the Imperium had geared towards its detection, the Lictor could evade. The hive mind had consumed far more advanced races than mankind. Infiltrating Ball was child's play. There was no need for it to employ a fraction of its considerable talents. Number seven, the Nightbringer. Mm. Considering that I just recently talked yeah. about the Catan in my last video, I'm gonna keep this entry short, but the Nightbringer definitely deserved to be on this list. He was said to be the most physically powerful of all the Catan, the godlike beings that devoured entire stars before eventually making contact with the Necron Tier and forming an alliance with them against the Old Ones during an event known as the War in Heaven. The Catan were originally formless entities, but the Necron Tier crafted them frames of living metal with which to inhabit. Each of these living metal bodies was said to represent the essence of each Catan. The Nightbringers sported a Grim Reaper motif which is quite fitting as the Nightbringer is figuratively and somewhat literally the embodiment of death itself. He was said to be the one that introduced the emotion of fear to the physical universe. This creature would mm -hmm. prey upon entire systems, taking a sick and twisted delight in the suffering he would inflict on untold billions, gorging himself on the terror of his victims. During the time in which the Necron Tier worshiped the Catan as gods, the Nightbringer was seen as the god of death, an entity whose hunger for the souls of mortals was never satiated. Now, in the 42nd millennium, the Catan exist as a shattered species, each of the remaining ones having been broken into dozens of shards. Each of these shards contains a splinter of the original Catan's power, and are said to be some of the most dangerous weapons the Necrons have access to. The Nightbringers are said to be the most difficult to control. Those who witness the towering form of the Nightbringer find themselves frozen with fear, as the icy fingers of death wrap around their mind, making them easy prey for his cold and calculated reaping. Number six, Goge Vandire. Unlike the other entries on this list, Vandire himself is not really much of a threat physically. He's an old man that through a huge campaign of coordinated assassinations, 
backstabbing and blackmailing, managed to become the head of not just the administratum, but also the ecclesiarchy at the time, making him single-handedly the most powerful person in the entire Imperium, and next to the Emperor himself. One second. I actually had a pretty lengthy segment on his entire backstory in my Sisters of Battle deep dive if you're interested. What makes him creepy is his utter insanity. The dude was a vindictive monster who, in his later years, was known to babble gibberish to himself at all times. Now, any who witnessed such a display were told that the Emperor was directly conversing with him, or more commonly, Van Dyer would just have them executed. At one point, he would discover a faction of warrior women known as the Daughters of the Emperor, who would one day become the Sisters of Battle. He deceived them into thinking he was the Chosen of the Emperor. The creepy bastard renamed them the Brides of the Emperor, conscripting them into service as his personal bodyguards. The lore doesn't go into a lot of specifics here, but it's not difficult for us to imagine this power-obsessed monster had taken this proud and honorable faction and degraded them into a harem of eye candy to be at his side at all times. His period of rule would come to be known as the Reign of Blood. No one was safe from his tyranny, and as his insanity and paranoia grew with every passing day, he would take to torturing any of those who opposed him, regardless of whether or not they were guilty. He would claim that through the sadistic acts he inflicted on others, he was purifying their souls. He had a massive network of spies and other militaristic factions that had pledged loyalty to him, whether it was because of belief in his cause or out of fear of what he would do if they refused his orders, most likely varies from person to person. That fear would have been well-founded, however, as he would unleash his armies against countless worlds within the Imperium if he detected even a small percentage of a planet and not being completely under his control. Whether that take the form of virus bombing innocent worlds to melting a planet's polar ice caps in order to drown its entire population, there was no limit to the profound levels of cruelty the mad ecclesiarch wouldn't condemn entire populations to. Due to his madness and paranoia, it is believed that many of these worlds were actually completely loyal, and that the bloodshed that would follow slaked nothing more than his ego. Thankfully, Van Dyer's rule would eventually come to an end, when many of the other Imperial forces rose up against him, including the Custodians, who at the time had retreated into the Imperial Palace, their role was to answer only to the Emperor, so they had mostly stayed neutral in the affairs of the Imperium. It was through a conversation with one of these custodians that Alicia Dominica, a woman that would become the first saint of the Adeptus Sororitas sometime later, and the founder of the Ebon Chalice Convent, would be convinced to journey to the Golden Throne, where it is believed that the Emperor spoke directly to her and told her the truth of Van Dyer's madness. She returned to the palace immediately and executed him on the spot for crimes against the Imperium. Despite his relatively short rule, there are still echoes of Van Dyer's reign of blood that continue to haunt the Imperium mm -hmm. even today, mm -hmm. thousands of years later. And he remains one of 40K's creepiest characters. Number five, Illuminar Ceres. The Necron dynasties can't agree on much, but one thing they seem to all be in alignment on is that Illuminar Ceres is a completely despicable monster. It was he that was responsible for the Necron's ascendancy into their living metal forms through biotransference. The genesis of their transformation may have started in the Catan's knowledge, but it was Ceres who built the machinery to make it happen. He has little remorse for this event, and sees it simply as another stepping stone to his ultimate journey of unlocking the secrets to life and eventually ascending to godhood. Despite his nature as something of a pariah amongst other Necrons, they still all recognize his sheer unequivocal genius, and thus no Pharon would be foolish enough to deny his support. As a being of living metal, Ceres is no longer hindered by sleep or the need to stop and deal with the countless frailties and needs of those who still inhabit bodies of flesh. Thus, there is nothing to distract him from his purpose. He is a creature with thousands of years of experience delving into the secrets of life, Yet, despite his relentless pursuit of knowledge, the secrets of the soul always seem just beyond his grasp. Some believe such forbidden knowledge was only ever meant to be known by the gods, a belief that Ceres refuses to accept. To the end of unlocking the secrets of the universe, Ceres has descended into a calculated madness of dissection, torture, and all manner of other horrors in which he inflicts on his captive test subjects. Whereas creatures like the Drukhari delight and feed off the pain they inflict on others, Ceres is seemingly immune to it, finding the act of torture nothing less than fascinating and ultimately enlightening. 
He is a mad scientist, an individual driven down a depraved path in the ultimate quest for knowledge, but sees no act as too taboo, malicious, or cruel. He is the incarnation of science taken to its extremes, unbound by the shackles of morality. Because of his complete understanding of organic life forms and the exact methods with which to deal the most damage and maximize their levels of pain and suffering, he is completely unrivaled when it comes to upgrading and augmenting every weapon, construct, and facet of Necron machinery. Even for a race as terrifying as the Necrons, his methods are seen by his peers as needlessly cruel, yet as will become a pattern with Ceres, begrudgingly accepted as a necessary evil. He accepts payment for his services in the form of captive slaves from all of the other mortal races, taking a particular delight in Eldari test subjects due to their ability to perceive sensations on levels far greater than any other race. Those captured by him will be taken to the laboratory catacombs of the tomb world of Xandragora, where they will spend the rest of their days in pain-filled agony, ancient stasis machinery keeping the subjects alive and fully aware through the horrific procedures he conducts upon them. He feels no pity, no remorse, or any form of kinship with such inferior life forms, and thus gives them nothing to numb or dull the pain. Such an act of mercy would be a waste of resources, and would add Damn. complications to achieving his desired test results. He finds the screams of his victims ultimately annoying, and thus in lieu of the aforementioned pain-reducing medication, he finds it more efficient to simply shut off his audio receptors, as his array of monomolecular tools tear apart his victims, molecule by agonizing molecule. Number 4. Typhus Originally known as Typhon, Typhus, first captain of the Death Guard and herald of Nurgle, is potentially the most feared of all the Death Guard commanders, and is most feared by Nurgle, seconded only to his Primarch father Mortarion. He would over time rise within the ranks of the Death Guard and eventually become the first captain. Although he had latent psychic abilities, he would keep these hidden from the Legion, as the Death Guard and Mortarion had no fondness for witches. During the Horus Heresy, he would find himself being pushed further down the path towards chaos, and eventually into the arms of Grandfather Nurgle. He would end up betraying his legion during their flight to the invasion of Terra. He did this by unleashing one of Nurgle's gifts, the Destroyer Plague, a horrific disease that caused the Death Guard to rot and mutate, inflicting profound levels of agony. Wow. Yet due to their superhuman levels of resistance to poison and disease, they could not die. It was only through Martarion eventually giving himself and the legion over to the service of the Plague Lord that the legion would be spared. They may have survived, but whether or not they had been saved is up for debate, as this was the event that turned the Death Guard into the Plague Marines. Typhus then absorbed the entirety of the malignant power of the Destroyer Plague into his body. The act of taking the disease within himself swelled his body to ridiculous proportions and fused his armor shut. He is now the host of the Destroyer Hive, an insect hive that grows inside of his body and is home to thousands of demonic insects that are each afflicted with the Destroyer Plague. Despite his act of betrayal, and most of the Death Guard view Typhus' actions as something that, albeit unforgivable, is in the past. There's no point in dwelling on that which cannot change. Over the last 10,000 years, Typhus would deliver Nurgle's blessing to countless worlds. It is said that 7 times 7 times 7 tallymen have dedicated their entire lives to counting the billions that have been slain in his wars. To this day, their tally has not caught up to the last 3,000 years of slaughter and considering the tally of the dead increases every day, it is a never-ending pursuit. Though, despite this notion, those slain by Typhus in the Destroyer Hive do not stay dead for long, as they rise back up as one of many different strains of Plague Zombie that will then in turn spread Nurgle's blessings even further. At one point, Typhus was said to have turned every living soul within the overpopulated world of Jonah into one of these undead monstrosities, creating a shambling horde of the dead that stretched across continents. The most disturbing thing about Typhus to me, other than the grotesque body horror, is his utter fascination with the proliferation of disease. There's an interesting passage from the Dark Imperium trilogy, where one of the commanders within Ultramar is dragged before Typhus. He planned on giving the captured individual Nurgle's blessing, even though he knew that someone as stoic and rigid as an Imperial commander would surely die from the affliction before the pain induced by the disease would enlighten them. The profound revelation brought on by Grandfather's love was ultimately going to be wasted. Before he could do this, however, a demon who wished to speak with Typhus began to manifest through the captured man, twisting and contorting his body in all manner of terrifying ways, seemingly as if he had been inflicted with every disease at once. 
The hideous mutation and untold agony presented in front of Typhus elicited nothing less than sheer fascination. A glorious display of Nurgle's love, rather than a blasphemous and horrific act of plague-induced torture. Number three, Urien Rakarth. The individuals known as homunculi are said to be some of the most revered people within Dark Eldar society. They are wise and ancient monsters, geniuses of insane and unnatural technology, who command just as much fear as they do respect. Each and every one is a master flesh crafter that offers a wide range of disturbing services to any within their society that can afford them. These services come in all different forms, but most commonly, disturbing potions, poisons, and elixirs, body modifications, or all forms of esoteric weaponry that are designed to inflict as much pain and suffering as possible. The homunculi are the undisputed masters of pain, as they have dedicated their entire lives to its study. Each one of them is completely unique, and no two homunculi are exactly the same. And deep within the bowels of their grotesque laboratories, they conduct all manner of terrifying experiments on the still-living test subjects they have captured. These places are grim abattoirs, filled with racks of gore-splattered torment slabs. Many of them are furnished with the stitched together bodies of living slaves, complete with walls and floors made of living flesh. To enter into a contract with such a monster is no small feat, and the price can be incredible. If you have any doubt why I choose to stream late at night, I present Exhibit A. Um, I'm not here for anybody else but gamers and horror freaks and you know um, uh, lovers of the weird and bizarre hi now that being said as the homunculi have unlocked the secrets of life and death and are able to regenerate any member of their species no matter how catastrophic the damage those who can afford it quickly become addicted to their services Urien Rathgarth was said to be the wisest, oldest, and most powerful of the homunculi. He is a wrinkled and unhealthy looking ghoul that is said to have a completely depraved soul, one that has twisted and ripened over countless millennia filled with abhorrent practices. It is believed that he has lived since the fall of the Eldari and has been killed countless times. Each time he crosses the veil into the Immaterium, he gets another glimpse into the untold secrets of the universe, returning with a plethora of new profane knowledge with which to hone his craft. It's gotten to the point where he has died so many times that he actively looks forward to it, savoring each death like a fine wine. However, mysteriously, over the last several cycles of death and rebirth, his form has regrown with a piece of his old body still intact twisting in such a way that the outside now represents the true horror within his soul. Mm. He is covered in grotesque limbs, some having been weaponized through his experiments, while other vestigial ones beckon all those in his presence into his embrace. The rumors insist these newfound mutations are due to a flaw in his practice, but the truth is they are by his own design. The Mad Prophet looks at his own body in the same way he looks at all of his victims, as a canvas to conduct his sickening art upon. He is the undisputed master of flesh crafting, gene splicing, and the brewing of ever more disturbing poisons. Recently, Rakarth and the Prophets of Flesh have begun a grand mission to capture living space marines from every Primaris chapter. He's fascinated by the degradation of the Emperor's original gene crafting work over the millennia. For what dark purpose he seeks this information still remains unanswered. Number two, Fabius Bile. Over this the years, guy. Fabius Bile has gone by many names. The Primogenitor, the Clone Father or Clone Lord, the Man Flare, and perhaps most famously, the Spider. A derogatory name the other Emperor's children called him due to the whirling system of mechanical limbs upon his back known as the Gerogen. Bile is a blight upon the galaxy and one of the most deranged, nightmarish figures to have ever haunted the physical universe. He is a twisted yet ingenious molder of flesh and sculptor of ever more nightmarish bio golems. And he literally wears a cloak of human skin if you needed any further indication of just how disturbed he is. Originally one of the Emperor's children's apothecaries during the Great Crusade, it was Bile's ingenious and disturbing personal search for perfection through surgical augmentation that gave rise to the many deranged upgrades that would come to infect the Legion. He did this through a complex web of terrifying surgeries and cocktails of synthesized chemicals that allowed each legionary to experience sensations to ever more extreme heights. 
Yet despite his ever-increasing escalation of more ingenious creations, Vile never actually subjected himself to any of these procedures. Instead, every <clears throat> surgery, every new invention, every act of torture and dissection were simply stepping stones towards the mastery of life and death, a journey that would one day lead him to the dark city of Kimura, where he earned the prestigious honor of being the only human to ever study under the homunculi covens. Other than the skin cloak, I feel like mm. the fact that the Dark Eldar took one look at this guy and were like, yep, I like the cut of his jib, <laughs> should speak to the levels of right? gravity that old Fabulous Bill had sunk to. <laughs> After the horse yeah. race, Fabius departed his legion and set off on his own to hone his craft, becoming a renegade amongst renegades. It is said that he moved through the Imperium like a shard of glass through an intestinal tract, offering to sell his services and creations to any rebel warlords that could afford it. His payment would come in the form of prisoners, genetic samples, and ancient technology. He would eventually set up shop within the Eye of Terror on a fallen Eldari planet, wherein, over time, the world would become a flesh factorum of crawling madness. Many other renegade apothecaries from various traitor legions would come to this world in order to study under the Clone Father, thus building his reputation and power. It's kind of like a Doctors Without Borders thing, except way huh. more horrifying. Any planet that has been blighted by the Clone Lord's presence can speak great volumes of his dark efficiency. He leaves a trail of twisted and grotesque abominations. Mad doctors visits. without barriers. All those that enter into a pact with him in order to procure his wares do so at great risk, as Bile has been known to demand entire hive cities worth of slaves as price for his services. And even then, it's not unheard of for him to unleash the bioweapons and grotesque monstrosities the bargaining party had requested upon their population simply to observe their efficiency. Despite his untrustworthy nature, the other traitor legions greatly respect the efficiency of his creations, whether or not they respect the spider himself. This is a man who has such mastery over cloning that he was able to make clones of all of the Primarchs to various degrees, including his masterwork, a perfect clone of the Primarch Fulgrim, an entity that retained all of the original's memories, and if the rumors are to be believed, a copy of the Primarch soul as well. In recent years, Bile has become obsessed with his goal of replacing the human race with a new, even more perfect species of his own creation that he refers to as the New Men. He views the human race as flawed, a species that is ultimately destined for the halls of extinction. Thus, he has spread his creations throughout human society, and one day, they will rise up to overthrow them and replace humanity as the masters of the galaxy. Number 1. Conrad Kurz if you know anything about the Night Lords, you know that they are probably the most horrific of all Space Marine Legions. They are blood-crazed psychopaths that prey upon the weak, utilizing fear as their most potent weapon and striking at the enemy's most vulnerable positions. The Night Lords do not choose to engage their enemies in honorable combat on the front lines, instead striking behind their defenses to massacre civilians and destroy their points of industry. When these dudes would go to take a world, they would admittedly do it with less bloodshed or warfare than any other legion during the Great Crusade. But the way in which they did this was by torturing a small handful of individuals and then stringing up their corpses for the entire world to see. They would then project images of the grisly display across the entire system, sending the message loud and clear that if you didn't want this to happen to you and those you love, you would bend a knee to the Night Lords immediately. None embody their twisted philosophies more than their Primarch Conrad Kurz, a man who was constantly tormented by visions of the future. These visions imbued him with a profound sense of paranoia and a nihilistic outlook on the nature of humanity. He saw human beings as nothing more than livestock, beasts of burden that needed to be corralled into obedience through fear and pain. This is the philosophy he utilized to conquer his homeworld of Nostromo. When he was young, he adopted the title of Night Haunter and systematically butchered the criminals that plagued his gang-infested world. His reign of terror eventually forced the planet into compliance, and fear of the Night Haunter caused Nostromo's criminals to either go into hiding or repent their ways, lest the Night Haunter come for them. His philosophy of ruling through fear would eventually be proven to be a flawed one, as ten years later, after his departure to lead the Night Lords during the Great Crusade, Nostromo would descend into its old habits, mm -hmm. becoming a criminal's paradise once more. Before this, the youth that would be shipped from Nostromo to be inducted into the Night Lord's legions were from the noble families. Without the Night Hunter there to directly coax them into obedience, the new aspirants would instead be taken from Nostromo's prisons. Thugs, murderers, rapists, and gutter scum of all forms would funnel into the legion. Over time, 
pushing the Night Lords to abandon any values they had left. Sickened by the infection of his legion, and harboring no sentimental value for the world in which he was raised, Conrad returned with his fleets and bombarded Nostromo, shattering the planet and condemning all of its Damn. citizens to death. Kurz was a sick and depraved person who delighted in the suffering of others, and mutilating and skinning his victims, sometimes as punishment for a perceived slight, if, but more often than not, just for fun. The throne room of his flagship resembled something more akin to a slaughterhouse. The floor, walls, and ceiling were all drenched in gore. His throne was surrounded by hundreds of chains and hooks hanging from the ceiling, upon which the bodies of his victims were placed, gently swaying back and forth. And if the accounts of the Primarch are to be believed, often whispering obscene prophecies to him. Later upon the world of Sanguelsa, he would construct a similar throne room known as the Screaming Gallery that took this concept to a far more disturbing level. And this is a passage from the Night Lord's Omnibus, where Talos, who at the time was a Night Lord's apothecary, witnessed the horrors on display. The first scene comes from the antechamber outside of the Screaming Gallery. The walls, like so much of the Legion's fortress, were formed from black stone, sculpted into forms of torment. Twist-backed humans arched and writhed motionlessly, captured at the moment of supreme agony, their wide eyes and screaming mouths shaped by sadistic devotion. Shaped, not carved. Talos hesitated by the doors, his fingertips tracing over the open eyes of an infant girl, reaching for the protective, worthless embrace of an older man. Perhaps her father. Who had she been before the Legion raided her world? What had she done with her short life before she was dosed with paralytics and coated with rock creep? What dreams were quenched by her living entombment within the hardening walls of a Primarch's inner sanctum? Jeez. This is what Talos Fucking saw Christ. when he entered the screen gallery oh, itself. Damn. Talos walked down the central pathway, boots thumping on the black stone, while the floor either side of the walkway rippled and tensed with the pliancy of human expression. Eyes, noses, teeth, and tongues poking from open mouths. The ground itself was a carpet of faces, flesh crafted together, kept alive by grotesque baroque blood filters and organ simulator engines beneath the floor. As an apothecary, Talos knew the machinery well. He was one of the few charged to maintain the foul ambience of the screaming gallery. Robed servitors, monotasked for the duty, sprayed gentle bursts of water vapor into the blinking eyes blanketing the floor, keeping them moist. Conrad was so absolutely insane Wow. His Primark novel, a series that, bear in mind, is designed to give the reader a deeper insight into a Primarch as a character, i.e. their goals, motivations, history, and just about everything else that makes them tick. It, Conrad's Primark book is a straight-up horror story, wherein a salvage crew picks up a stasis pod they find floating out in the void of space that contained the Night Haunter. They're not sure what to do with it, as it's clearly a space marine inside, but it's way too large. Conrad then proceeds to somehow break out of stasis and hunts down each member of the crew, one by one, slaughtering them in the most grotesque ways imaginable, and then stringing up their remains for the other members to find, taking a sickening delight on the torment he inflicts on all those within the ship. If you're a horror fan and a 40k fan, this is an absolutely must-read book, and I really don't want to spoil it. It doesn't really give you a lot of deeper insights into his character other than he's fucking crazy. And I absolutely loved it. When I was ordering this list, it honestly came down to a tie between Fabius and Conrad. Urien Rackarth is incredibly disturbing, but he's also a Drukhari, and that's kind of par for the course for their entire species. Not that human beings aren't capable of great evil, as that's certainly true, but it's because we have a baseline to go with with humanity as there are good humans out there who want to do the right thing. Seeing just how far these two characters have gone into their insanity, it kicks it up a notch on the creepy factor. For me, it really came down to their most recent novels. The Fabius Bile trilogy doesn't shy away from the fact that he is a monster, but it tries really hard to humanize him and makes you sympathize with the villain. That's not a knock against the series. It was incredible and remains as some of my favorite 40K books of all time. But with Conrad, it's the exact opposite. His Primark book sought to dehumanize him, even more than the considerably low levels he had already sunk to. He is a monster. There is nothing redeeming about him. You can sympathize with him that he is a tortured soul and had a rough upbringing, but that's about as far as it goes. He's not a character you're meant to understand. You're not meant to relate to him. 
That's not to say you can't love him as a character. I fucking love the Night Hunter. He's one of the most fascinating people in the entire setting to read about. But there's nothing relatable about him. He is fundamentally irredeemable. His story ends with him allowing himself to be assassinated to make a point. And since we have a beginning yep. and an end for his story, he will never get a redemption arc. Every new piece that comes out about him, every new insight we get, is simply designed to terrify the audience even more. And that's why, in my personal opinion, the number one spot could go to no one else. But what do you guys think? Do you agree, or is there somebody that creeps you out far more in 40k? Does 40k have the most terrifying characters, or is there somebody from a different franchise you think is way scarier? Was there somebody I didn't include on this list that you feel deserves to at least be mentioned? Let me know in the comments section okay. down below, as I read just about everything y'all post, and I love hanging out and engaging with all of you. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell to be Already subscribed, buddy. Ugh. Okay. Um. <clears throat> I need to go stretch my legs before we hop into Diablo. Um. stretch my legs and smoke a cigarette uh, don't go anywhere well unless you want to grab something to drink <laughs> something to eat uh, perhaps something to smoke because uh, we are about to uh, we're about to jump on Diablo I'll be right back
now that I have two kitty guardians to keep me company. my fucking treat bag. treat bag Swipe my treat bag too. One, one second, guys.
Bloop. Let's go ahead and pull up the blizzard and Network enabled, uh, play enabled. Um, hold on for one second. And take the TV room off. There we go. Oh, uh, uh, uh. All right. Uh, a little laggy th uh, this evening or this morning. I'm not ready yet. Oh, I'm not ready yet. Ooh. I cannot do that here. At least you can get up and close. Uh, at least you can kind of see your character and everything. And like, so your their character creation wasn't completely uh, 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 wasted. You know, like. Yeah, you have a face that's unique, and a, you know, and you did all this stuff, but you'll never see that thing again. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Um, let's uh, go do. Let's do a dab real quick. Um, get the felines in the sky high. Aha! Uh -huh, you like that little run? Got a new dab in there. Stay up there, little lady. Don't you try jumping down while I'm trying to do my dab. Hope everybody's doing okay tonight. I hope your week was okay. Um, mine wasn't terrible, but it wasn't, you know, great either. Um, I'm hoping, uh, well, I'm gonna sleep today. I, like, I'm not trying to do anything except for uh, enjoy this last day of beta. Um, I'm going to play for a few hours here and then I'm going to get some sleep and then when I get up I'll hop back on for the last uh, full day of uh, beta play while um, the masses are on. Music, lovely. I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of digging it a lot. Um, shave my head in the morning, or in the afternoon. Ah, morning. I usually don't see. Oh no, that's not true. I see mornings, and this this coming week, I'm going to be working uh, mornings 
Uh, so uh, I will be getting up fairly early. Fuck. Fuck. Oh, oh yeah, it's already right here. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else caught it today, but uh, Domino's was running a special, um, like 50% off any of their pizzas. So uh, I got like the works or something, or like uh, like one of those ones that had everything on it, uh, like all the meats and uh, plus peppers and onions and mushrooms and green peppers uh, and and uh, jalapenos, uh, which were extra but worth it, totally worth it. Um, and it, uh, instead of being like 27 bucks, it came out to 17, um, which for a large pizza with every fucking thing in the known universe on it, yeah, yeah, that was that was worth it. Uh, I just finished it. Uh, well, I stepped out a little bit earlier. Uh, it, was, it was a whole me. Uh, it was for like for the whole fucking day though. Uh, I think I ordered it around. Three or four, and uh, it lasted me until two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. Not bad. Let's see. And timer going. so cool too. Fucking Serpentor. I remember I used to have his little sled and everything. Um, I always thought, uh, I always wished it looked cooler, but it was still his uh, flying platform and everything, so it was cool. chain um, um, we actually need to um,
really want a corporate explosion. Um, I need thorns. But we're going to go with... any of those either um, except for maybe lucky hit but I'm too okay so um, I guess I have to go with blood mist for now um, I do, I do need to get it, but I don't think I can, I can't get it yet. I think I can yet. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. Oh, now it's now it's ready to. Okay. All right. So. Boom! Splinters. Book of the Dead. I think I'll stay with the skirmishers though. recruits have been training night and day they deserve a little praise but I can't let them see me as soft mind giving them a cheer for me easy going for you a boost of confidence for the recruits and I get to go on being the hard ass everybody wins I'll handle it I think this was a I think this is one of a quest in uh, um, immortal Come on, stop! Thanks. I 
help that don't get used to it. <laughs> Wahoo! steps in search of that pale man from your vision. I must know what part he plays in all this. But first, I need you to retrieve something of mine while I finish my negotiations. A merchant in the center of the city has it. Just tell him I sent you. Alrighty. A prophecy, yes. It foretold the rise of the prime evils, the return of Lilith and Inarius, the doom of our world. Inarius adopted the prophecy for his own selfish purposes, put it in the Cathedral of Light's gospel, and made it seem like he would be the hero to save us. Ah, uh, in that while he, in that why he was, wouldn't he, wouldn't he like um. I remember there was an angel that was cast down into hell, I think it was in Diablo 2, and he was turned into one of those, um, I think it was a, a, a pit fiend or, uh, or something, or a taskmaster or something like that, uh, uh, for his vanity, um, wasn't that this, wasn't that Anarius? Um, the cathedral loves to go on about him. His imprisonment in hell, his valiant escape. There we go. His glorious return here, the world he created. But they never mention how being tortured in hell for a few millennia turned you into an ass. <laughs> Sacrificing, summoning demons, holding all the wonderful gifts that Lilith gave them. Tattoos, sway back. Cloudy eyes. This poor thing. Good. Ah, so the old man's finally decided to buy it back. Knowing him, he didn't mention coin, did he? <laughs> If he wants his weapon, you will need to pay. Alrighty. I, I, I believe. Wait. The old man sold me this too. He said he didn't need it anymore, but I think he'd want it back all the same. No charge. Apology. 
gift. He also gave me this amulet. What is it? The mark of the Haradrim. An ancient order of scholars and mages sworn to protect sanctuary from demons. These days, we are few in number. There is another Haradrim. Donna. His breadth of knowledge about demons is equal only to his hubris. Sounds like he could help us. Hmm. You should seek him out in Skosgarn. But don't forget about the cathedral. They'll be expecting you, and they might prove to be useful allies too. You're not coming with me. I'm going to the dry steps to find out who that pale man is. Join me when you can, just... Be careful. Your ties to Lilith, the visions you see, you are the key to finding her and stopping whatever she has planned. And sometimes our paths in life are set to collide. We just don't know it. Whether it is by accident or fate's hand, there is nothing we can do about it. The wanderer lost in the storm fed the blood of Lilith, saved by a lone monk. Different lives and incidents drawn together. By what? Destiny? If. Or some greater power pulling the strings? I did not know. Yeah, I, um... Uh, but at the time, I thought I had the chance to protect humanity from the daughter of hatred. The Wanderer's connection to her gave me hope. <laughs> Imagine that. I need to optimize this game real quick. Uh, Nvidia just did did just welcome to the beta. Yes, yes. I will pre-purchase. I will. It's got a, uh, uh, I want to see if I can optimize uh, the game. Okay, so it automatically should. Okay.
Alrighty then. Um, we don't really need to go anywhere else right now. Um, so let's go this way. Seven. Does that lead into that? We do not know. Let's go back that way since the quest is back that way. Plus, there is a quest. Yes, well, Bozan has yet to return from delivering our tithing demands to Menistad. Perhaps you could sweep the roads and see what's taking him so long. The cathedral must receive its dues. Yeah. Vigilant against sin, brother. Oh, I remember yes, her from the trailer. Like the light of an audience, burn away wickedness. Let not temptation lead you from his holy radiance. Let righteousness sear away corruption and sin. Cast Ooh, out thy sounds darkness, like a Roman Catholic to me. Only light must remain. Cast out thine darkness, for only light must remain. Is this the one from the vest? Yes, Reverend Mother. Did Morath not accompany? He sent me on without him. Putting faith in that old man was a mistake. What could possibly be of greater import? Lilith. So, you know. Hmm. We have received word from one of our knights. The demon sighting in Gale Valley. The description matches too closely the sighting in the vest. If you would travel to Yelesna and take stock of the events there, you would have the gratitude of the Cathedral of Light. I had thought to send Lorath, but again, he fails in his duty. Will he does not. Lorath, the will of an audience shall be done. Me with a goddamn skull hanging on my hip. Take the night's report before you go. Reverend Mother, I received a report of a potential demon sighting. A horned woman near Yesna Mines. Performed routine inspection. Nothing yet. 
sent in priest and escort of knights. We'll report in when we find something. ¿Por qué, Dios mío? ¿Por qué? Did it. Shit. I hope my fucking my my computer didn't get fragged. Oh shit. Um If you can still hear me, um uh I think I'm gonna have to restart my computer.